Today, I am announcing the normalization of diplomatic relationships with Vietnam. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from Hawaii. My name is David Santoro, and I'm Vice President and Director for Nuclear Policy Programs at the Pacific Forum. Welcome to the fourth edition of the US-Vietnam Indo-Pacific Conversation Series, our virtual webinar series organized in partnership with the University of Social Sciences and Humanities, USSH, at Vietnam National University which is generously supported by the US Department of State through the US Consulate in Ho Chi Minh City. So during the previous session, the series revisited two of the most important Vietnam War legacies, the recovery of the remains of Americans missing in action and the issue of Agent Orange. These issues remain sensitive matters that continue to require a lot of attention but as, as speakers have highlighted, the people of the United States and Vietnam have worked hard to manage these problems and bridge the gaps in their respective perceptions, priorities, and policies. So today, the United States and Vietnam are important partners and the relationship is improving and improving fast. Leaving behind their past uh, as Cold War um, adversaries, Hanoi and Washington upgraded their relationship into a comprehensive partnership in 2013, which is a highly promising development. The next logical step is to elevate the relationship to a strategic partnership, which in effect would mean a deepened security engagement that goes beyond mere gestures of friendship. So how do we depend uh, U.S.-Vietnam defense cooperation. For instance, what are some of the ways to improve U.S. and Vietnamese ability to deter conflict in the South China Sea? What capacity building initiatives should be explored? What are Vietnamese expectations of the role of the United States in regional security and stability? So today we are joined by Dr. Le Hong Hiap, lecturer at Vietnam National University in Ho Chi Minh City, and Hunter Marston, who is pursuing a PhD at the, university, at, at the Australian National University in Canberra. So let me just um, give you a little bit more information about our speakers. Dr. Le Hong Hiep is a fellow at the Vietnam Studies Program and the Regional Strategic and Political Studies Program of the ISEAS Yusof Isak Institute in Singapore. He is also an editor at the Institute's flag, of, of, of the Institute's flagship journal, Contemporary Southeast Asia. Before joining ISEAS, Dr. Lei worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam, and he also taught at the Faculty of International Relations of the Vietnam National University in Ho Chi Minh City. He's a prolific author and has notably written two books, one called Living Next to the Giant, The Political Economy of Vietnam's Relations with China under Doi Moi, which was published in 2016. And the second one is Vietnam's Foreign Policy under Doi Moi, a book co-edited with Anton Svetov and published in 2018. 18. Hunter Marston is, as I've mentioned, a PhD candidate in international relations at the Australian National University's Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. And he's uh, also a 2021 non-resident WSD Honda Fellow at the Pacific Forum. Uh, prior to joining the ANU, he worked at the Brookings Institution and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And he also spent time at the US Embassy in Myanmar. 
He writes regularly on US foreign policy and Southeast Asia with publications in uh, contemporary Southeast Asia, the New York Times, foreign affairs, foreign policy, as well as in the Washington Post. So before I turn over um, the floor to our speakers, uh, let me just make a few uh, disclaimers. So the views expressed here by the speakers and by myself as moderator do not necessarily reflect the views and official positions of the United, the, the United States Department of State, the US consulate in Ho Chi Minh City or the United States government. All views and opinions expressed in this webinar also do not necessarily reflect the positions of the Pacific Forum or of the speaker's home institution. Finally, all remarks, including those during the question and answer portion are all on the record. We are live, not just through the Zoom platform, but also on Facebook, so please be mindful of that. Um, so now, without further ado, let me turn over uh, to our Vietnamese guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Le Hong Kiap. The floor is yours for your presentation and please limit your remarks to 10 to 12 minutes. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, thanks to uh, the Pacific Forum for inviting me to join uh, this uh, very timely uh, webinar. Um, we have just uh, celebrated the 25th anniversary of Vietnam-US relations. And this year we have a new government uh, in the US and also a new government in Vietnam. So it's timely uh, to discuss the prospects of uh, Vietnam-US defense cooperation. So within the next 12 minutes, I will touch upon five key uh, themes. First, I will set the scenes by uh, saying a few things about the historical background of Vietnam-US defense cooperation. And then I will discuss the current status, the drivers and the challenges to bilateral defense cooperation. And I will wrap up my presentation by uh, touching on the prospects of uh, bilateral defense cooperation under the two new governments. Um, so you all know that Vietnam and the US normalized their uh, relations in 1995. And back then in the 1990s, um, defense cooperation was very limited and it was mainly related to the power mere issues. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, there were further improvements, but uh, still uh, the relationship uh, were, was really limited to military medicine, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and also uh, some demining cooperation uh, in the early 2000s. I think the main uh, landmark was the uh, an MOU on defense cooperation uh, signed in 2011 um, to advance bilateral defense cooperation. And we all know that 2011 was the year when the US started to talk about um, its pivot to Asia. Uh, two years later in 2013, uh, Vietnam and the US uh, established a comprehensive partnership. And among the areas of cooperation, uh, we have the world legacy issues and also defense and security uh, issues. And uh, two years later in 2015, uh, the two countries also issue a joint vision statement on defense uh, relations. And the statement called for, among other things, an expansion of defense trade between the two countries and also potentially including cooperation in the production of new technologies and equipment. Uh, another landmark came in 2016 when the Obama administration lifted its ban on the sale of uh, lethal weapons to Vietnam. Uh, in November 2011, the uh, two countries adopted the 2018-2020 Plan of Action for U.S.-Vietnam Defense Cooperation to implement the 2011 MOU and the 2015 Joint Vision Statement. They also announced a plan to deepen and gradually expand security in intelligence cooperation enhancing information sharing and joint training on issues of mutual concerns. And since then, there have been talks about upgrading bilateral ties to the level of uh, strategic partnership, as David has just mentioned. So if we look at the current status of uh, bilateral defense cooperation, we can see that over the past decade, since uh, 2011, uh, defense cooperation between Vietnam and the US have been continuously strengthened. Uh, especially in the ter in terms of policy coordination, coordination, there have been more uh, visits by high-ranking uh, military officials uh, of the U.S. to Vietnam and also from Vietnam to the U.S. And um, uh, the most recent visit was by U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper uh, to Vietnam in November 2019. Last year, there was no visit because of the 
COVID-19, but I expect that after the uh, pandemic ends, there will be more exchanges um, between the two countries. Uh, another highlight of uh, uh, defense cooperation between the two countries is the U.S. maritime capacity building assistance for Vietnam under the Maritime Security Initiative and the Foreign Military Sales Program. Uh, the U.S. have transferred Vietnam to decommission U.S. Coast Guard captors uh, with one more plan for future handover. Uh, the U.S. also provided Vietnam with 24 metal shark patrol boats. Um, 18 of them have been handed over to Vietnam uh, by 2019. And there have been discussion about U.S. transfer of uh, six Scan Eagle UAVs to Vietnam um, and some other, um, you know, uh, initiatives as well. And according to the Defense uh, Department's Indo-Pacific Strategy Report in June 2019, the U.S. military also engaged Vietnam in numerous annual training exchanges and activities to enhance bilateral cooperation and interoperability with the Vietnam's uh, People's Army, Air Force, Navy, and Coast Guard. Uh, the DOD has also provided training and technical assistance to support Vietnam's 2018 deployment of a medical unit to the UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. Uh, another visible uh, symbol of uh, improving uh, Vietnam-US defense uh, cooperation is the uh, visit by US aircraft carriers to Vietnam, the first in 2018 and the second in 2020. And in 2018, Vietnam also participated in the US-led RIMPAC military exercise for the first time. Last year, there was no uh, participation from Vietnam because of the COVID-19. But again, I think after the pandemic, Vietnam will resume its participation in such exercises. So um, the, sum, uh, the, the, um, the status of uh, I mean, uh, bilateral cooperation in, in defense is, uh, is that they are, the ties is, is, are being strengthened. Uh, but from my observation, the cooperation is still not substantive enough. Um, so there is still a lot of room for further uh, substantive defense cooperation activities in the future. Um, so looking back, um, we can see that although uh, there's still room, I mean, the, 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 the cooperation is still rather limited and not substantive enough, but I think compared to 10 or 20 years ago, we still uh, a substantial uh, development. So what are the drivers uh, for the, the, the recent development in bilateral defense cooperation? I think first there's a strong economic cooperation uh, which uh, facilitates and create the foundation for strategic cooperation. Uh, from my perspective, uh, it's very difficult for the two countries to uh, strengthen their defense cooperation if they don't have a strong economic cooperation. Uh, the economic foundation makes them feel uh, more comfortable and more confident and uh, in, in conducting cooperation in defense and it makes them uh, increasingly important partner for each other. Uh, another uh, factor is the positive perception of America by the Vietnamese public. Uh, numerous surveys done by the Pew Research Center have so shown that uh, Vietnamese public have very good uh, perception of America and America's role um, in the region as well as um, the uh, America's role in the South China Sea. South China Sea. Uh, and this leads to the increasing importance of each country in the other's uh, foreign and security strategy. Uh, that, are, that also means there's an uh, increasing convergence of uh, strategic interests between the two countries, especially regarding how to deal with the rise of China and the South China Sea dispute. Um, from the Vietnamese perspective, the US is currently Vietnam's most important bilateral partner in the South China Sea. This is what I heard from many people in Vietnam that I have talked to over the years. Uh, some people say that um, the US is the only country that has a sufficient material capabilities and political will, political will to balance China. And it also has conducted actual activities in the South China Sea to challenge China's claims. So that's what uh, Vietnamese people appreciate you know, from, uh, from the US uh, presence in the region. The DOD's Indo-Pacific Strategy uh, report in 2019 also stated that uh, through the implementation of the National Defense Strategy in the Indo-Pacific, the U.S. is prioritizing new relationships with Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Uh, so I think it's not a, co uh, a, 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 a mere coincidence that uh, Vietnam is listed uh, in the report and ahead of Indonesia and Malaysia. That also that means that the U.S. is really paying more attention to Vietnam's strategic role in the region against the backdrop of its intensifying, intensifying uh, strategic uh, co uh, competition with China. 
so these drivers will continue to work to drive uh, bilateral defense cooperation forward. But I think uh, the two countries also face certain challenges uh, in uh, uh, further promoting their uh, de defense ties. Uh, first, I think despite uh, the generally solid foundations of uh, bilateral uh, relations, um, uh, there remains a lingering level of distrust uh, between the two sides, especially on the part of Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, some Vietnamese, uh, you know, uh, politicians are still concerned about the peaceful evolution, you know, uh, or the U.S. or, or, or uh, any attempt to, to undermine the uh, Communist Party's rule in Vietnam, uh, and this is reflected by the U.S. Uh, emphasis on values and human rights issues. It is an, an inherent obstacle given the nature of the political systems of the two countries. And until early uh, the early 2010s, uh, you know, uh, Vietnamese leaders still sought assurance from their American counterparts uh, that the U.S. will not harbor any ill intentions towards Vietnam's and the party's regime. Uh, such concerns led to the commitment by both sides in 2013 that they would respect each other's political systems. Uh, this commitment has been repeated in various joint statements issued during subsequent bilateral high-level visits. Under the Trump administration, the U.S. has not did not emphasize human rights as well as other liberal values, uh, thereby facilitating bilateral uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, however, if the Biden administration, for example, or subsequent U.S. administrations highlight these issues in bilateral uh, relations, I think uh, bilateral defense cooperation may face setbacks. Second, uh, there remains a gap in the two sides' capabilities in conducting substantive joint defense cooperation initiative. Uh, I think despite uh, Vietnam's significant force modern modernization efforts over the past decade, Vietnam still lacks certain uh, technical capabilities, uh, experience, and skilled human resources to conduct complex uh, high-profile defense initiatives. Um, and cooperation has so far been limited to simple humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercises. And to address this issue, the U.S. has provided some assistance to Vietnam. For example, Vietnamese officers have been sent to America to attend language and technical training programs. Uh, however, I think more needs to be done to enhance Vietnam's capabilities in participating in substantive joint defense cooperation in initiatives with the U.S. as well as with its allies. Uh, third, an enduring issue that has long constrained bilateral relations is Vietnam's long-standing wish to maintain a strategic balance between the U.S. and China. Uh, I think this is why uh, Vietnam uh, canceled, quietly canceled 15 defense engagement activities with the U.S. scheduled for 2019. Uh, and I think the decision, decision appeared to be one of Hanoi's reaction to the intensifying strategic cooperation between U.S. and China. Uh, and given the intensifying competition between the two countries, I think Vietnam will try to keep a balance and uh, not to upset its ties with, uh, with China uh, by siding further uh, with the US. The final constraint I think is the uh, three no's principles uh, in Vietnam's defense uh, policy. That is no military alliance, no foreign base on Vietnam's soil and no relationship with one country to be used against a third country. In the 2019 Defense White Paper, Vietnam added the fourth principle of no use of force or threat of force in international relations. This, is, uh, this principle generally prevents Vietnam from entering into certain substantive defense cooperation activities that are seen to violate the principle. Uh, the Defense White Paper two years ago also states that depending on the circumstances and specific uh, conditions, Vietnam will consider developing necessary appropriate defense and military relations with other countries. It is to ensure some level of uh, strategic flexibility for Vietnam to deal with uh, contingencies, especially if China continues to act aggressive in the South China Sea. However, there is no clear definition of the circumstances and specific conditions that warrant an exemption from the three nose principle. As such, I think this ambiguity may to a certain extent continue to constrain the potential uh, of Vietnam's defense cooperation with the US. Now I will wrap up uh, the discussion by uh, uh, talking a bit about the prospects of uh, bilateral uh, defense cooperation. I think there will be little change to the prospect of bilateral defense cooperation under the Biden administration and after the 13th uh, Party Congress uh, of Vietnam. 
uh, bilateral uh, defense ties will likely continue to strengthen, but at the same time, will continue to face some of the challenges that I have just mentioned. The U.S. may want to push for stronger military engagements with Vietnam. Uh, apart from existing act, uh, activities, um, the U.S. may want to push for arms deals or greater access to Vietnam's military facilities or to engage Vietnam in mini, uh, mini lateral defense cooperation arrangements like the Quad does. Uh, meanwhile, on the part of Vietnam, uh, Vietnam will also wish to continue strengthening its uh, defense and security ties with the U.S., but I think at a measured pace uh, with which Vietnam is comfortable. Vietnam's priority now may include capacity building assistance for its military as well as law enforcement forces, training, intelligence sharing, defense technology and equipment production cooperation, and some selected uh, arms transfers, as well as the war legacy issue and also peacekeeping cooperation. Uh, Vietnam may still have reservations about high profile cooperation activities, such as granting the US with greater access to its facilities or joining major military exercises with the US and its allies. Vietnam wants to maintain strategic autonomy, uh, so it wants uh, and it also wants a stable and peaceful strategic environment conducive to its internal development. Therefore, I think Vietnam wants to maintain stable relationship with China, even when it is willing to stand up against China in the South China Sea. Uh, as I think while there's still ample room for further improvement in bilateral defense uh, cooperation, we should be realistic about how far and how fast Vietnam can go in this effort. There should be some strategic patience on both sides. Something we should watch is China's future actions in the South China Sea. If China continues to act aggressively at the expense of Vietnam, I think uh, the so-called one depend condition will at some point be activated and Vietnam will be willing to accelerate its defense cooperation with the US. Otherwise, I think we should expect gradual selected improvements in the two countries' defense ties only. However, as uh, David mentioned, one immediate goal for the two countries is an, in the next four or five years is to upgrade bilateral ties to the strategic uh, partnership level. I don't think it, it is something too provocative uh, to China, yet it lays the legal and political uh, foundation or framework for both countries to further deepen defense cooperation in the future. So on that note, I will uh, end here and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. This was a great start to our webinar. Uh, Hunter, over to you. Sure, I'll just uh, pull my slides up here. And uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes, it's a, it's a little big, but that might take a little time to adjust itself. Is it is it more than full screen? Yeah, it, it's a little it's a little too big. It might uh, usually it takes a you know a few seconds to adapt, or you can okay. I don't know if you can change it or not, but sometimes it adapts itself. How does the second slide look? No, it's still too big. Uh, is this better? That, if I just works. go off? You can use it that way. That's that, that, I think that'll work. Right. Um, OK, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share some of my perspectives on the US-Vietnam relationship. Um, I uh, am glad for HIP's um, introduction, int uh, first round of remarks. And I actually will echo many of his uh, themes and some of his uh, points. Um, so I don't want to repeat too much of what he's already said. Uh, suffice it to say that I pretty much agree with uh, his presentation in its entirety, and uh, I'll try to fast forward through some of the uh, repetition. Uh, but for all of the sort of historical points that he brought up, uh, maybe my presentation will sort of uh, hammer them home a little bit further into your memory. Uh, so speaking in broad strokes, uh, I'd like to identify a few of the uh, incentives driving Vietnam's relationships uh, bilaterally with the United States and with China. I'll divide these up into uh, two categories, uh, realist or what I would uh, describe as security and economic concerns uh, versus constructivist incentives, uh, by which I mean ideological, historical and cultural ties. 
So with regard to the United States, um, Vietnam and, and Washington increasingly share a threat perception toward China, especially regarding some of China's behavior in the South China Sea or the East Sea, as Hanoi calls it. Uh, Vietnam in recent years has pursued uh, internal balancing, by which I mean military modernization, particularly with regard to its Navy uh, and Coast Guards. Uh, and some of that comes with US support. Uh, it's also pursued external balancing in the form of deeper, deeper cooperation with the United States and with like-minded countries such as Japan and India. Uh, regarding China, Vietnam sees a big neighbor it can't avoid. It's a geographic reality and it's not going away. So for obvious reasons, Hanoi wants to have a stable relationship with China. At the same time, China is the largest trade partner of the country and uh, by the latest data I've seen was the fourth largest investor in 2020. Um, as Hip mentioned, uh, Hanoi does have suspicions or doubts lingering toward the United States motives uh, with regard to its democracy and human rights uh, promotion. Particularly, it uh, has in the past feared uh, what's referred to as peaceful evolution, um, which could be a sort of cover for uh, regime change. Um, democracy and human rights have uh, invited some frictions into the bi bilateral relationship, uh, but we're working past those, I'd argue. Um, with China, Vietnam has a long history, uh, a thousand years of occupation and conquest, uh, yet in more recent years and more recent decades, um, China was an ally, was a partner, and uh, supported Hanoi's efforts in its war for national liberation, first from the French and then from the Americans. They also share a long history, culture, and a uh, similar political system. So that ideology does bind them at some uh, points. However, uh, as I see it, these ideological ties are weakening as the security threat and um, threat perceptions toward China have risen in the last decade. At some point, um, this basic equation will become imbalanced. Uh, now, I'd argue that Hanoi is already wrestling with this question of how much it values its trade and investment from China when uh, its biggest benefactor is also the largest security threat. Um, so as he really uh, eloquently spoke to, Hanoi is walking this sort of middle path. Already there are signs that uh, Vietnamese elites uh, really don't trust China and see its motives as less than benign. In a survey last year by the Institute for Southeast Asia Studies, uh, respondents, 61% of respondents from Vietnam said that they see China as a revisionist power intent to turn Southeast Asia into a sphere of influence. And you'll see that that uh, figure is higher than in all the other ASEAN countries. Similarly, uh, Vietnam reports very little confidence in China to do the right thing to contribute to global peace and security. I think a major turning point in the relationship between Vietnam and China was the 2014 oil rig crisis of which much has been written. Uh, in May, China deployed an oil rig near the Paracel Islands uh, in waters close to uh, Vietnam's coast. Um, in Vietnam, responded by deploying its own maritime surveillance vessels and Coast Guard ships and uh, protests set off uh, in Vietnam. It was really a significant rupture in the relationship. Um, in July, uh, Beijing announced that it was withdrawing its oil rig a month earlier than previously expected, and the two countries patched up the relationship with a high-level visit uh, of Le Hong An to Beijing as a special envoy of the General Secretary. So it appeared that everything was more or less back on track. Yet we see uh, some significant changes in Vietnam's behavior around this time. Um, in 2013, the Obama administration and Hanoi uh, upgraded their relationship to a comprehensive partnership. In 2015, um, General Secretary Nguyen Vu Trong traveled to Washington and visited Obama in the White House, which was a really significant uh, visit, the first of, such, of its kind by a Vietnamese leader of his rank. Um, also in 2014, the Vietnamese began hinting at the possibility of pursuing legal action against China for its claims in the South China Sea or East Sea. Uh, Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Yung in uh, 2014 said in Manila that Hanoi was considering various defense options, including legal actions in accordance with international law. And that same month, Minister of Defense, uh, Vietnam's Minister of Defense told the Straits Times on the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, that they were considering legal action at the time. 
Um, at the same time, Hanoi starts to deepen its partnership with the United States. Um, and that continued under the Trump and Obama administrations. So um, as I said, uh, Vietnam and the United States upgraded their ties to a comprehensive partnership in 2013. And Obama visited uh, at the end of his administration in 2016 to Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, where the United States significantly announced that it would uh, lift the lethal weapons embargo that it had had in place for decades, which was controversial domestically. And I think it should be noted that uh, Obama did this despite a lot of uh, human rights groups saying that this was the wrong move. Um, similarly, under the Trump administration, we see notable advances in the relationship. Uh, Trump wasn't without his frictions. However, um, on his first, during his first few days in office, he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was kind of a blow to Vietnam uh, because Hanoi expected major economic gains from market access to the United States. Trump also labeled Vietnam uh, uh, one of the single worst trade abusers, and uh, you know Hanoi found itself in an uncomfortable position under scrutiny from Washington for its trade practices. However, uh, Vietnam also figured prominently in the US free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis visited Vietnam twice in 2018. And as he mentioned, the uh, first US aircraft carrier since the Vietnam War, the USS Carl Vinson, visited Da Nang in 2018, really opening up uh, a significant channel for increased cooperation between the two countries. Um, at the same time, Vietnamese views of China were shifting. Uh, a poll in 2015 by the Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences found that only 6% of respondents thought Vietnam should strengthen ties with China, while 92% of Vietnamese supported strengthening relations with the United States. So um, back to the original matrix that I presented, I think attitudes are shifting uh, with regard to both the United States and China in Vietnam, which signals promise for the relationship uh, with, with Washington, that is. Um, Hanoi is also careful, very careful to balance good relations with Beijing. Um, it's kept up high level visits um, from the Vietnamese Communist Party to Beijing and prioritize stable relations despite frictions in the South China Sea. Um, as I said, Vietnam figured prominently in the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, of the Trump administration in uh, the 2017 National Security Strategy. Uh, Washington noted that it saw Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore as growing security partners and pledged to strengthen those partnerships. At the same time, Vietnam was experiencing uh, significant maritime tensions in the year 2017 uh, when uh, Chinese Coast Guard ships were harassing a Vietnamese uh, oil exploration operation uh, in conjunction with Spanish firm Repsol near Vanguard Bank to the southeast of Vietnam's coast. Um, and this was a particularly acute moment uh, in bilateral uh, tensions for Vietnam and China. In July of 2017, bowing to Chinese pressure, Hanoi canceled the Repsol exploration project. And uh, these come at a significant cost also. Hanoi or Petro Vietnam has to pay hundreds of millions of dollars when canceling such uh, projects uh, under Chinese pressure. In response, China, uh, sorry, in response, Vietnam is pursuing um, external balancing by deepening its security partnership with the United States. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, Washington transferred 18 metal shark patrol vessels to Vietnam. And in May of that year, uh, Prime Minister Nguyen Son Phuc uh, visited the White House, further strengthening the, the diplomatic relationship. The 2018 National Defense Strategy echoed the US commitment to Vietnam, um, mentioning uh, Vietnam this time ahead of um, Sorry, I'm just looking through some notes here. Uh, in front of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, um, which was uh, somewhat noteworthy. Um, also in June of 2018, Vietnam joined the US-led Rim of the Pacific Maritime Exercises for the first time, the largest international naval exercise in the world. So you can see these, uh, um, the relationship is expanding uh, to take on new activities. Um, just a quick correction to my point about uh, Vietnam's mention in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. It was actually the 2019 Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, which he also mentioned, where Vietnam 
so sort of leapfrogs Malaysia and Indonesia in, in naming order. Um, so I, I actually I thank Bella Tran for pointing that out in her East West Center report. So back to uh, closer to the present in 2019, China is uh, once again uh, at the forefront of Vietnam's strategic calculus. Uh, there's another incident off of Vanguard Bank when Chinese Coast Guard ships are intimidating Vietnamese resupply vessels working to um, working with uh, Russian firm Rosneft and its Japanese contracted Hakuryu 5 oil rig. Uh, these tensions lasted right up until October. Uh, we're really um, front and center in Hanoi's uh, security uh, concerns of the year. At the same time, when Futrong was supposed to travel to uh, Washington that year, was rumored to have suffered from a stroke. Um, and there was a lot of speculation about would this be the time that uh, Vietnam and Washington upgraded ties to a strategic partnership. So there's still sort of, uh, we're left wondering when that will come about, uh, as he suggested in his, at the end of his presentation. The Trump administration was also more vocal in defense of um, uh, Vietnam security and spoke out to uh, protest against China's reclamation and militarization activities in the East Sea. Um, despite these significant tensions, Vietnam has uh, frequently used de-escalation to uh, moderate ties and stabilize the relationship. I won't get into the defense white paper because he has already covered that but I do think that it signals an intention or openness to uh, push back more against China by exploring further external partnerships. Just to recap, I think that the ideological components uh, that incentivize um, stability with the China relationship and mistrust of the United States are actually declining, while the security concerns are rising to the forefront of Hanoi's concerns. Uh, which to me signal uh, hope for progress, uh, at least towards uh, stronger US defense cooperation. In conclusion, um, I think that Vietnam uh, will remain cautious in its engagement of both major powers. It will seek stability and do its best to prioritize uh, equanimity in its relationship with Beijing um, as it continues to deepen the relationship with Washington. Um, Sorry, I didn't really get into the Biden administration and looking ahead, but hopefully we can do that in the Q&A. Thank you all for listening and uh, I'll hand it over to David again. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of our speakers for excellent and very comprehensive presentations. Let's move on to the Q&A session now. Um, everyone should now see or very soon the instructions on the screen on how to proceed with this. So to ask a question or make a comment, please use the raise hand function located on the participants tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Wait to be called and unmuted by Pacific Forum staff before speaking and please state your name, position and affiliation before commenting or asking a question. Alternatively, you can also post your question in the Q&A tab but if you're going to use that, uh, please also identify yourself by stating your name and affiliation and I'll, I'll, I'll just read out your, your question. Um, I'll, I'll try to get as many questions as possible, uh, but I expect there will be a fair amount. So with that, uh, let's see what I have now. I don't have too many, let me, let me in fact, um, if I may, I use the prerogative of the chair to, to ask the first question. I, I you know, I, I think what, what I got from both of your presentations is that the, the move from coordination to cooperation in the, in the bilateral relationship has in many ways been made and um, that we are really at some, some deep level of cooperation already. Um, at the same time, I heard you both say that we need that, that relationship to be a lot more substantive strategically. And I want to, show that, I want to make sure that I heard that right. Uh, but here, I think I heard you say also that uh, Vietnam, and I, I actually took, note, took a note, I, so correct me if, my, if I'm wrong, but I think that you said that Vietnam is comfortable with the current pace of the evolution in the bilateral relationship. And then you talked about the challenges uh, that need to be overcome. So, so the question that I have for both of you to, to frame this discussion is what's next really for the relationship? 
what's the next level of cooperation? Is it, is it expansion of cooperation in new areas or is it deepening of cooperation of what we're already doing? Is it both? And then what specifically would you recommend the two countries should do uh, go, going forward? Uh, so you don't have to answer that, that, that now. Let me, um, I, I see a number of people coming in and wanting to ask questions. So let me uh, just put that on the table and then uh, I'll um, invite James Lee uh, to speak. So if uh, Pacific Forum staff can um, allow him to speak, please. Thank you. Sorry, Thank, you. You. Thank you, I'm James Lee and I'm an adjunct fellow at the Pacific Forum. So my question is really, uh, so while, while trying to strengthen uh, cooperation uh, with the United States, does Vietnam try to also work with other Asian, with other Asian countries in, in its efforts to, to counter the rise of China, especially in the South China Sea? In other words, you know, is it, uh, uh, does, does Vietnam try to work with, or at least try to enlist the help of other Asian countries in efforts to counter the rise of China? So, you know, so that it'll be not just uh, Vietnam and US working together, but Vietnam and other Asian countries along with uh, the US in trying to uh, counter the, uh, uh, the rise of China. And, and, if it, and if Hanoi is doing that, is that kind of, so is that kind of effort uh, uh, making progress? Thank you. Who wants to take that on first? Uh, okay, uh, thanks, James, uh, for your question. I think uh, Vietnam has adopted a, a policy of uh, diversification and multilateralization of its foreign policy, not just um, to, I mean, to, to uh, in its um, overall foreign policy, but also in its dealing with the, the South China Sea dispute. So as you mentioned, Vietnam works not only with the US, but also its allies and partners, uh, such as Japan, India, Australia, uh, the EU, for example, and also with ASEAN and ASEAN member states to address the South China Sea issue. Uh, but uh, why Vietnam tries to highlight the role of ASEAN, I think there are limitations in uh, you know, uh, how much uh, Vietnam can, can get from, from ASEAN uh, in terms of dealing with China because of the, the consensus um, decision-making principle and also the uh, division uh, within ASEAN and also different interests of ASEAN member states. So Vietnam uh, wants to promote ASEAN's role in regional security and also is in, 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 in its dealing with the, the, the South China Sea issue, but it knows that uh, it has to move beyond ASEAN. And that's why Vietnam wants to strengthen ties with the US, but not just the US, uh, also other countries. Vietnam do not, does not want to rely on any single country or a single organization in dealing with um, with China or the South China Sea issue. Thank you. Answer, do you want to add a few things to this? Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I, I would emphasize that uh, the Vietnam def um, and Japanese uh, defense cooperation uh, is something to pay attention to. I think, um, like Yip said, uh, Vietnam is multilateralizing and diversifying its strategic ties, uh, and Japan will play a big role in that, uh, particularly with regard to Coast Guard modernization and uh, naval capacity. Thank you so much. Um, so to follow up, um, to follow up, I have a question from Hien Phan, who's a PhD candidate at uh, the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And the question is, uh, how would you compare the Vietnam-US defense relationship with other defense relationship between the United States and Southeast Asian countries? Where would you, I think the question really has to do with where would you rank it in, in, um, in comparison to other uh, ASEAN? And then um, a, 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 I guess separate question from the same person, um, is that uh, Vietnam and the United States have a different approach to their relationships with China, while the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy um, and the, the, the TPP aim to contain China's rise, Vietnam does not want to be trapped 
in any anti-China relationship? How, um, how does this perception gap, gap uh, challenge U.S.-Vietnam defense relationship? You, you actually addressed that already, but I, this, is, this is part of the same, the same question. Yeah, if I may, um, I, I think Vietnam ranks highly in, in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy or, or uh, whatever we're calling it now, um, as far as U.S. engagement with uh, security partners in Southeast Asia. Uh, as, as a um, recent webinar just a couple hours ago uh, drilled home, I think that Singapore is really one of the most prominent security partners for Washington in Southeast Asia. Um, but Vietnam, the relationship is growing quickly, uh, and they've clearly demonstrated, I think, more willingness to lean towards Washington than, say, countries that have more muted foreign policies uh, and want to keep their heads down, like Malaysia and Indonesia, which are formerly uh, U.S. Uh, strategic par or security partners, uh, but often exercise a great degree more caution or are less willing to sort of publicize uh, some of that defense cooperation. Uh, so I'd put Vietnam right up there, um, perhaps under Singapore, in uh, as far as the U.S. Uh, security relationships in Southeast Asia go. Okay, I just want to add uh, some quick comments. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Vietnam is not as a strong partner, uh, defense partner of the U.S. as some other countries, as uh, Hunter said, uh, Singapore is still more important and has more substantive uh, cooperation with the U.S., but Vietnam is a promising and also a rising partner especially in the context of U.S.-China strategic competition, given Vietnam's growing capabilities and also its strategic uh, geographic location. Uh, on the second part of the question, I think, as I mentioned, there's an uh, increasing convergence of uh, strategic interest between Vietnam and the U.S., especially in dealing with China and on the South China Sea. But I think the gap you mentioned is mainly related to how to do that. I think um, Vietnam does not really want to have a tense relationship with China uh, because China is still very important to Vietnam's uh, security and economic well-being. But at the same time, Vietnam wants to confront China in the South China Sea and to stop China's maritime expansionism in the South China Sea. And on that, I think uh, both Vietnam and the US have shared the same interest. But again, uh, how, to, how to, to deal with China is, is something that they may not necessarily agree on at the moment. Go ahead, Hunter, I saw it's a finger. Yeah, uh, if I could just piggyback on Hip's comments, uh, because I realized I didn't respond to the second question. Um, I, I think, yes, there's a clear divergence between Vietnam's and uh, United States approaches to China. Uh, Vietnam lives next door to China and has to therefore um, exercise a degree more uh, um, delicacy in its interactions with uh, Beijing. The United States is a huge power, but it's far away. Uh, so therefore has a lot more flexibility and, uh, you know, and, and is willing to throw its weight around and it's uh, superpowered them to confront China. Um, but I think this may have been a larger problem during the Trump administration in some ways. Uh, Secretary Pompeo was one to sort of uh, drill in this view that countries have to choose between a free and uh, open order or a repressive authoritarian world order that China championed. Uh, this made a lot of countries in Southeast Asia uncomfortable. Despite this, we saw the Vietnam-United States relationship uh, do quite well under Trump. Uh, not to give the Trump administration too much credit, I think that these are due to some of the underlying structural factors and ideological and the reduced ideological frictions that, uh, that I've mentioned. Um, so I think if anything, that now that Trump is out of the White House, uh, that the Biden administration will uh, offer a much more nuanced foreign policy that puts less uh, emphasis on choosing sides and uh, listens more and shows up in ASEAN to engage with countries like Vietnam. So that'll probably be welcomed by Hanoi. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me call on uh, Jake Steiner. To, to speak, please um, give him permission to speak. There you go, sorry, you, you're on. Hi, David. Um, I'm, my name is Jake Steiner. I am a former research intern at Pacific Forum and now just a student at University of St. Andrews. Uh, my question was actually very similar to the previous one in that now that we're moving into the, especially Hunter mentions the sort of realist um, China boogeyman 
prerogatives have sort of started to trump the frictions over ideology and human rights. But as we sort of start the Biden administration, which is likely to have a more forceful perspective on human rights, admittedly a low bar compared to the previous administration, how would this sort of change the strategic calculus in um, Vietnam, if at all? Or is the sort of China boogeyman still the more important concern? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yep. Yep, uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, I think uh, Vietnam shares uh, some concerns, uh, I mean, uh, regarding uh, US emphasis on uh, human rights, you know, democracy, liberal values, etc. But I think the US uh, is also very, uh, you know, uh, selective, you know, in applying these rules uh, throughout the history, not until not only uh, now. Uh, so we have seen examples in the history where the because of strategic interest, the US can uh, ignore uh, certain issues, uh, human rights issues, and, and, and strengthen ties with the other uh, states that do not share the same values with the US. In the case of China, I think they do it the other way. Uh, and Vietnam is, is concerned that at, maybe at some, some point in the future, the US may also um, you know, uh, play up this issue. But I think in the current strategic uh, environment, uh, the US will not uh, highlight the human rights issue in Vietnam, uh, but at the same time will emphasize the human rights issue in China. It is mainly because of the, the different strategic uh, calculation of the US towards Vietnam and China. So I think uh, it will not, it may be a, a potential issue for bilateral relations, I mean, Vietnam and US, as I mentioned in uh, my presentation, but my guess is that uh, it will not be a big issue um, and bilateral strategic cooperation will continue to strengthen no matter what. Thank you. Hunter, do you want to add something to, to this? Uh, no, I, I think I agree. And I think he uh, put it very well that uh, this is, you know, a perennial uh, difficulty in balancing US foreign policy, interests and values. Um, and we'll see how it plays out. Uh, but if the Obama administration is anything to go by, um, I think with uh, um, some of the same team in place, we'll see that it carefully calibrates the balance there. Um, and it may upset some people who want faster defense cooperation. It might upset some people who want more emphasis on human rights. Um, that's the nature of foreign policy. Great, thank you. Uh, let me combine two questions, the different questions, but I think you can probably address, it, uh, address them um, together. The first one is from Charlie Brown, who's asking, what might we see with Vietnam and, and India um, in terms of defense cooperation, are there opportunities to align or at least deconflict with uh, the U.S. efforts, uh, or are are these relationships strictly separate? So that's that's the first question. And second question, uh, this is by uh, Laura Abbott, uh, who's a Pacific Forum young leader. Um, this is her, she actually has two questions, but I'll just focus on the first one because the other one has already been ad, uh, addressed, uh, is basically Vietnam's expectation of the role of the United States in the South China Sea. So if you could um, expand or elaborate on how you, how you see Vietnam's expectation of the role of the US uh, there. Kiev, do you wanna go first? Uh, okay. Uh, for Charlie's question. Uh, I think the, uh, I mean, uh, India is also becoming an increasingly important uh, strategic partner of Vietnam, uh, especially because of the shared uh, threat perception regarding China. And we know what uh, has been going on between China and India recently. And that means India has more incentives to strengthen its strategic ties with Vietnam. Uh, and it has also uh, deepened its involvement in the South China Sea dispute. Um, and there have been reports of the US, uh, I mean, India providing Vietnam with the uh, BrahMos supersonic uh, missiles. Um, um, so I think um, Vietnam will continue to strengthen ties, uh, uh, defense ties with India. And it is part of Vietnam's, you know, uh, strategy of diversification. Uh, 
uh, it will try to work with not only the US, but also India, Japan, and other countries. And the same uh, for Vietnam's relation with India. Vietnam will not only focus on its relation with India, but also with other partners. And if that can, Vietnam can combine all these efforts in uh, one I mean, common platform, such as the Quad Plus, for example, that will be great because they can coordinate uh, policies and also actions. But as I mentioned, Vietnam still has some concerns about uh, China's reaction, for example. So I think for now, Vietnam will observe and see how the Quad and Quad Plus will evolve in the future and to see what are the benefits and also the downsides or the challenges that may arise if Vietnam really engage the Quad um, to coordinate its uh, relationships with um, the Quad members. For uh, Laura's question, the uh, Vietnam's expectation of the role of the US in South China Sea, I think it's quite obvious um, over the past few years, we have seen Vietnam's, uh, you know, quite support for US uh, uh, role in the South China Sea, including uh, US phone ops, uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Uh, Vietnam has not protested. It does not clearly support or, you know, provide verbal support for such uh, operations, but Vietnam has kept rather quiet about this, and that means Vietnam has been rather supportive of uh, such um, activities as long, as long as such activities comply with international law and contribute to the peace and stability in the region. Vietnam also expects the US to speak up against China, uh, you know, uh, claims, illegal claims, and that's why I think Vietnam is quite happy with uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, statement last July about China's claims in the South China Sea. So, um, and also the Vietnam's ex expectation is that the US will continue to maintain its presence and so to support uh, Vietnam to build up its maritime capacity um, in, in the South China Sea. So those are the key um, expectations uh, from Vietnam regarding the US role in the South China Sea. Thank you. Yeah, if I, can, if I can add to that, um, uh, Charlie, I think you might know more about um, uh, what's going on with India and Vietnam than I do. Um, I, I would note that India trains Vietnamese personnel in submarine um, usage. Uh, so I think that that's one promising uh, area, especially as Vietnam begins to shift its uh, military focus from traditional land-based security to maritime activities. Um, I think it will rely increasingly on partners like India and Japan that I mentioned to uh, meet its capacity needs there. Um, and then with regard to Laura's question, I won't really speak for the Vietnamese side, which she has addressed, uh, but from the Biden administration, um, I think what we could look to in the, the first year or so is um, what, what does the national security say, uh, strategy and national defense strategy say about Vietnam's role in the Indo-Pacific and how, how does uh, Washington see its own Indo-Pacific strategy evolving. So I'll be looking for those documents uh, in the first 150 days or so. Um, and then after that, you know, will it, it confirm as General Secretary again, as, as it looks likely to uh, take place, will General Secretary Trump visit Washington after all? And, you know, would we see this visit be the opportunity to upgrade ties to a strategic partnership? I think 2021, 2022, uh, after we get out of COVID are ripe for continued progress in the relationship. So I'm optimistic that we'll see some high level visits really break ground there. Thanks very much. Uh, let me now give the floor to John Litchfeld. Go ahead, sir, you, you, you're on. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Yep. Thanks, Sandra. I really appreciate the, uh, the discussion so far. It's been great. Are you able to hear me all right? Okay, great, sorry. Um, so looking ahead to um, the next few years, I, I think we can say the cooperation on environmental and climate issues it seems like a natural alignment between Vietnam and the incoming Biden administration. And I understand Vietnamese security forces are beginning to more outwardly recognize and acknowledge the risks of environmental degradation and climate change among a range of non-traditional security threats. So I, I'd like your opinion on uh, how you believe Hanoi assesses the possibility for increased security cooperation on these non-traditional security issues, and in particular um, for cooperation on the Mekong River, um, where Vietnam seeks to protect its Western Front. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
how did you want to start on that one? Uh, sure, it's an excellent question. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks for chiming in. Um, I uh, will have to say that John knows way more about this, these issues than I do. Uh, John is an excellent researcher on the Mekong uh, and Vietnam security at the Timpson Center. Um, so I'd be curious to hear what he says, but since I'm forced on the spot here, I would say uh, I would like to see the Biden administration put some more emphasis on the Lower Mekong Initiative with the Obama, which the Obama administration had sort of gotten started, but we didn't really see all that much progress with in light of China's uh, larger Lansang Mekong uh, cooperation uh, LMC initiative. Um, so I think that there's plenty of work to be done there. And I'm sure you hear the same things I hear from Vietnamese counterparts that uh, more than the East Sea in some ways, uh, Vietnam is very concerned now about what China's hydroelectric dams throughout the upper and lower Mekong dam mean for Vietnam's uh, food security, uh, particularly with regard to the lower Mekong that flows through southern Vietnam uh, and inundates a lot of the uh, rich agricultural land that Vietnam depends on for rice. I mean, this isn't just a food security issue, it's also one of Vietnam's biggest exports. So it really does, uh, like some of these South China Sea disputes, start to pinch the purse of uh, Vietnam's uh, decision makers and, you know, can also uh, instigate domestic unrest if, if it's not uh, something that's dealt with. Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, Hunter has addressed the Mekong issue. So I just want to ask some quick comments on the first part of your question. Uh, yes, I think um, the Biden administration uh, focus on the environment and climate change issue will also facilitate uh, Vietnam-US cooperation, not just in terms of defense cooperation, but also energy cooperation. In defense cooperation, I think the two countries will continue to uh, uh, strengthen cooperation regarding humanita humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, which they have done for some time. Uh, but at the same time, I think a more important and also uh, emerging area of uh, cooperation between the two countries, um, not purely economic, but also strategic, is energy cooperation, especially the uh, construction of uh, LG5 power plants in Vietnam. There have been a number of US backed uh, LG5 power plants in Vietnam. And if uh, those projects can be constructed uh, successfully, that will contribute to the strengthening of bilateral ties, not only because uh, they solve in part the uh, trade deficit issue of the US regarding Vietnam, but also provide the, the opportunity for the two countries to uh, expand uh, their cooperation uh, to, to another very important um, area that is strategic uh, in infrastructure uh, development. And this is all the more important given the fact that the US also competing with China in this area uh, against China's BRI. So I think this is also something that the two countries can do more under the Biden administration. Thanks. Thank you. Let me now give the floor to Birch Tuan. Go ahead. You can you can you can speak. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I have actually have uh, two quick questions. One is for Dr. Lei. So yeah, thank you for, for the remarks. And uh, you, know, you, you said that um, you know, back in 2019, Vietnam canceled 15 defense activities with the US because of China. Uh, and I also read one of your articles and you said that it was partly because of the US countering America's adversaries through sanction acts. So it, you know, it could be both, but uh, do you see one of the two reasons is more prominent than the other? And should I ask the second question before, yeah? Yeah, yes, please go ahead. Okay, and then the second uh, question is for both the speakers that you know, I read in the, you know, the joint statements for enhancing the comprehensive partnership between the United States and Vietnam in 2017, there is a sentence saying that the two sides agree to strengthen cooperation in the field of security and intelligence. So I wonder whether that sentence means that the mean intelligence sharing between the two countries. And if, if yes, could you share with us what you know about where the Vietnam and the United States are sharing intelligence? Thank you. 
Th thank you. That that last part might be a little difficult, but I, 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 I um, yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, I, th I think uh, this. Uh, thanks, Vic, uh, for your question. I think. Uh, I mean, this is a very different question. I don't have inside information to share with you. Uh, so for the first question, I don't really know the reason, but I think it's more likely that uh, Vietnam decided to cancel such activities mainly because of uh, its concerns. Uh, uh, regarding uh, U.S. China uh, intensifying um, uh, competition, uh, Vietnam does not want to see by to be seen by China as you know uh, strengthening or, or starting with uh, the U.S. Uh, when um, the two powers are picking a fight. Uh, so that's that's that may be one of the reasons. But of course, um, another reason may be uh, as you mentioned, Vietnam's concerns regarding the. The the the, uh, the U.S. and a new law, new act, but I think it may be a less important factor because now we have seen that uh, since then bilateral defense cooperation continue to to be strengthened. So I think if uh, Vietnam was concerned about U.S. sanctions uh, or, or punishment, I think we 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 cannot expect you know bilateral uh, cooperation in general and defense cooperation in particular to to be strengthened uh, over the past few years. Uh, for the second question, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have information, but uh, yes, I, I think that um, the two countries' intention is to increase or, or to expand the scope of their you know, defense cooperation, including uh, intelligence sharing. So I think uh, that's something they can do, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, that's something Vietnam may want to push uh, in the next few years. Thank you. Hunter, do you have anything to add uh, to the to um, Not, Not much, except I would anticipate that as Coast Guard cooperation continues, that uh, maritime domain awareness and that sort of intelligence uh, will naturally follow. Uh, also, with uh, the 2019 announcement that uh, uh, Vietnam would buy six um, aerial drones from Boeing, uh, I think that naturally requires uh, intelligence sharing and training. Uh, I'm not entirely sure as to the logistics of how that sort of thing uh, works operationally, uh, but it seems like the signals are all there that the uh, relationship uh, will require some intelligence sharing going forward if cooperation is to deepen. I see, thank you. G great, thank you. Um, let me just ask the final question um, and from the Q&A um, the Q&A room will will Vietnam put any case regarding the South China Sea territorial and maritime disputes before an unclassed tri tribunal and relatedly what red line would China have to cross to push Vietnam to do so and this is um, this is also a question by Charlie Brown from, from Bruce, Allen, Bruce Allen Hamilton. So I guess this is uh, you know, probably a question more directed to you here. Okay, uh, thanks Charlie. I think uh, Vietnam has been preparing all the necessary you know, potential scenarios you know, regarding the South China Sea dispute, including filing a case against China's claims in the South China Sea before an, uh, a tribunal. Um, but I think it is more a political uh, decision than a legal decision. I think uh, Vietnam understands uh, the, the advantages as well as the disadvantages in doing so. Uh, Vietnam may win the case given the precedent set by the 2016 arbitral tribunal ruling, but there are certain uncertainties. For example, if uh, Vietnam filed a case against China regarding the press sale, for example, uh, it, it is not clear yet whether Vietnam will really win the case because the uh, geographic uh, features in the press cells uh, rather different from those in the spread list. For example, the largest uh, feature in the press cells is four times bigger than the, feature, the largest feature on uh, typing island in, 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 in the spread list. So it's unclear whether Vietnam uh, can win the case. And moreover, if Vietnam really wins the case, uh, the benefits may be limited. We can look at the, the Philippines-China case. Uh, China that does not stop uh, its ag aggressions in the South China Sea. And more importantly uh, for Vietnam, I think filing a, such a case may um, you know, 
put a lot of constraints on Vietnam's uh, China relations, something Vietnam does not really want, given the, the, the importance of China to Vietnam's security and eco economic well-being. So I think, well, uh, what is the red line? I think that's the key question. What, what can push Vietnam to take this action? I think um, maybe if China takes a, you know, a invade you know, Vietnam's health future, a future in the spread list, for example, or do something that will um, obviously uh, you know, harm Vietnam's core interest in the South China Sea, for example, planting another auric in Vietnam's EEZ, for example, uh, something serious, you know, uh, and Vietnam may feel that it has no other options but to, to go for the legal option. But for now, uh, in the absence of such activities by China, I think Vietnam will not take any such uh, course of action anytime soon. Terrific, thank you. Hunter, do you want to add something? Um, I don't have anything much to add. I mean, the, the whole thing is when, when are all other options exhausted? And to me, it would seem that that uh, point has already occurred. Uh, China is now annually ramming and sinking Vietnamese shipping boats, deploying its oil rigs in Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. Um, so it's shown no sign of recognizing Vietnam's uh, lawfully uh, granted uh, territorial waters. And I, I don't see how that willingness to use coercion uh, has left Vietnam many other options. Um, so frankly, I see Vietnam uh, um, using a whole lot of patience and uh, putting up with a bunch of uh, bad behavior by China. Um, so I thought it would have lost its patience already and pursued this option perhaps, but the fact that it hasn't is a signal that it really does prioritize somewhat stable relations with China, whatever it can get. Um, so I don't, I don't see how any significant uh, uh, or continuation of Chinese coercion in, in uh, the EC will push Vietnam towards that option now. But Hanoi has floated the option before and, and mentioned it publicly in 2014 a couple times when uh, tensions were at a high. So I'd never rule it out. Very good, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that we have to stop at, you know, on, on, on that note, but um, I want to thank you both for your excellent presentations as well as uh, the audience uh, for also excellent questions. Uh, please stay tuned for the fifth edition of the US-Vietnam Indo-Pacific Conversation Series, which is happening next month in February. And our next ses se session will explore US-Vietnam economic and trade relations. So pl please stay tuned uh, for that. Also uh, be aware that we at the Pacific Forum run similar sessions with other partners. We had a session just um, a few hours ago uh, on US-Singapore relations. Uh, we also run sessions with the Philippines. And uh, next uh, week, we're actually doing the first session of our US-Australia uh, conversation series. Uh, and it'll focus on the, the future of the US-Australia alliance in the Indo-Pacific. So with that, thanks again to our speakers and to everyone. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, aloha. Today, I am announcing the normalization of diplomatic relationships with Vietnam.